Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. This is the last day. It's the day before the Oscar nominations, and it's about damn time. They are very late this year. Usually they're like the second week of January. But here we are. It's the second to last week of January. Well, the last full week of January, I guess. And, um, yeah, it's... Uh, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be an exciting one here as we get into the final stretch. Um, now there's a couple things here before we go and get started here. First of all, we have to say that the uh, nominations will be announced live um, starting at 5:22 Pacific Standard Time tomorrow. Um, so I will have a live reactions here tomorrow as long as the internet works and everything, which it should. I don't see a problem with that. Um, <clears throat> and it is, you know, that will be pretty early, so, um, I won't be able to shout and get all worked up, uh, because I don't want to, you know, it's, it's early. You don't want people <laughs> coming at you that early, so, um, just give you a heads up there. Um, now I'm checking out the official Oscar website here. They say that, um, they're going to do it as they usually do in two bunches, um, and that, um, <clears throat> by, um, my estimations here, hang on, do they say if it's, it's pre-taped, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, which they did last year too, they, um, brought in a few people and they talked about something for a minute, about the importance of the Oscars, <clears throat> God, my throat won't quit, uh, they talked about, like, yeah, their import, their importance, or when they were nominated, because they, I think they had, like, Octavia Spencer and Terrence Howard and a few others on there, um, and they just give a little thing, and then they say, here are the nominees for this category, and then they, uh, uh, reveal it there, uh, one at a time. So, what they're gonna do here, and they say, this is in no particular order, but they're gonna do a, the first bunch, it's pretty much, uh, from what I'm reading here, there's 24 categories, I think they're gonna do 12 and 12, if I counted right here. Yeah, 12 and 12. So they're going to start with, and again, this is in no particular order, cinematography, costume design, film editing, production design, makeup, score, animated short, live action short, sound editing, mixing, and visual effects. And then um, uh, they're going to come back about 16 minutes later, and then they'll do the acting races, animated, directing, documentary short and documentary feature, foreign language, and screenplay categories, and, of course, original song and best picture. Again, those are in no particular order. They're just kind of listing them there. So, yeah, so that's how we're going to do it here. I'll have uh, what I'm planning on doing right now is as soon as this is done here, I'm going to print up a sheet and just have the five nominees and some other potential ones written down. Uh, and then I'll just circle or put an X by it. You know, that way I don't have to, you don't have to hear me, you know, <laughs> frantically typing as I've had to do in some other ones. Plus it's 24 categories. That's a lot <laughs> to try to remember because some of them have three, some of them have five, some of them can, you know, of course, best picture can go up to 10. So that's a lot of memorization and I'm, I'm not there yet. So, <laughs> and especially since it'll be early too, my memory will probably just be like, you know, did I eat at Wendy's twice yesterday? Yeah. One of those jokes or something. Jim Gaffigan, I love him. Anyway, so, um, yeah, so I wanted to get that out first. So, yeah, we will be doing this live here. Um, yeah, I'll have a sheet or, you know, a couple slips of papers. I think I, I did that last time, too. That worked out pretty well. So, um, or two years ago, whenever it was, I, uh, I did that and it worked out. So, uh, that's what they're going to do, and that's tomorrow. Uh, I'll get up a little early, and I'll probably start because, uh, uh, you know, of course, when I do these live videos, I always have to start recording them like five or six minutes early. So I'll, I'll probably do that again just to make sure everything works and uh, all that. Now, I think, because uh, usually Oscar nominations and the Globes and stuff, they're usually also uh, broadcast on television. Uh, I would guess ABC since it's on ABC. So if all else fails, I'll turn on the TV. I'll get it cranked up to as loud as I can without it being annoying and and uh, do it that way if all else fails. And I'm not sure if they're going to, um, I don't know if they're, hang on a second. Actually, I'm reading this again. Uh, Pre-taped category will only be featured in the first half. Okay, so they will have somebody there live announcing the, the second part. Sorry. Yeah, it's good to read this stuff before you say. <laughs> anyway, so, um, yeah, but I guess from what they're saying here, because the Globes, they don't televise the first part of their nominations like they did this year. Uh, they don't do the first part, but they'll do the second part. Um, I'm not sure if they would televise, because I, I, as far as I remember, they televised the whole thing for the Oscars for uh, 
all 24 categories. So uh, as far as I know, that's what they're going to do on TV as well, uh, in case anybody is watching these on TV. But um, in the meantime here, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started here. Uh, the only other thing I can mention here before we start is I did finally catch up on a couple other movies yesterday. Uh, I didn't have time to mention them in the SAG video, but I finally saw The Post and I finally saw Phantom Thread. So I think that's all the movies I've seen are the ones I'm predicting for picture, director, actress, and the rest of the uh, acting categories. The only one I haven't seen yet is Molly's Game. Uh, I have that getting into adapted screenplay and nothing else. Uh, otherwise, I've seen, I think, everything else in the top eight categories. So, um, yeah. Yeah, the only other one I haven't seen is Mudbound, which for it's on Netflix. For whatever reason, I I just not haven't sat down and watched it yet. But again, I'm 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 not betting on that one because of the Netflix uh, bias. So uh, let's go ahead. We're actually going to start at the bottom here with the short categories, and then we're going to work our way up to Best Picture. Okay, so starting with the three shorts, let's start with animated short here. Uh, I have my five being In a Heartbeat, Cradle, Dear Basketball, Negative Space, and Lou. Uh, I haven't heard a whole bunch of discussion here because it's these five, and then there's also, because uh, this is a, a short list category, there's also Lost Property Office, Revolting Rhymes, Fox and the Whale, Garden Party, and Life Smartphone. Um, which for me, it's like, sometimes when you're predicting these categories, you kind of just have to go by the title alone because, uh, yeah, the people who nominate these, it's like they don't always, this. sometimes they admit that they didn't watch them. So, um yeah, I haven't heard really any negative buzz on any of these five that I have picked. If we're just going by titles, though, I think something like Garden Party sounds appealing, Fox and the Whale sounds appealing, so some, maybe those two would be two alternates, but uh, uh, Cradle, I know, is from one, uh, I, I don't know, the animator, but uh, he has won before, so um, so I know that one it has gotten some uh, some good buzz here. All right, documentary short is up next. I have Alone, Heroin, 116 Cameras, Heaven is a Traffic Jam on the 405, and uh, I'm going to go with, uh, I'm still trying to decide because right now I've got uh, Traffic Stop and they're just going off of the title, but uh, if, we're, yeah, if we're looking at some more titles here that sound appealing, the other five uh, shortlisted here are 10 Meter Tower, which I originally had, Edith and Eddie, K.A.O., Knife Skills, and Ram Dass Going Home, um, which of those five Knife Skills sounds like it would be pretty uh, pretty appealing. So I'm actually uh, going to go ahead and put that one in instead. Yeah, <laughs> live switch here. Anyway, so yeah, I'll go again. I'll name those off again. Alone, Heroin, 116 Cameras, Heaven is a Traffic Jam on the 405, and Knife Skills. Let's go with those five. <laughs> Anyway, so again, I haven't heard really too much negative buzz on any of these. Edith and Eddie looks like it's an animated one, which sometimes the animated do get into the documentary short category if they qualify. So uh, I'll list that one as, as a potential upset here. Okay, for live action short, uh, DeKalb Bell Elementary is the one everybody's talking about this year. It's, you know, again, no real negative buzz on that, so I have that one out front. Uh, the Silent Child, Watu Wot. Watuote, uh, Rise of a Star, and the 11 O'Clock is my fifth one. Uh, my Nephew Emmett is also up here facing Mecca, Icebox, Witness, and Lost Face. I originally had Lost Face in here, but then uh, I've looked at it, nobody else is predicting it. So um, I'm like, well, I could either put something else in and get it right, or I could be the lone guy and, you know, one in a thousand, maybe one in a million chance, get that one right. But uh, no. I'm taking enough, I'm taking enough risks in other categories now that I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, leave this one with uh, five more likely contenders in that one. Uh, but yeah, I, I would still say just based off, you know, if, again, if we're just going off of uh, the titles here alone, Lost Face sounds appealing, uh, Icebox sounds appealing, and um, Facing Mecca, actually. I could you know, maybe see that one getting in. Just Again, just going off of the names here. I, I, again, I don't watch any of the shorts, but... Uh, yeah, every once in a while they'll put it like a. I think they put it in theaters too. They'll just package all of them together and and send them out. So um, you know, if that comes around, maybe I'll get a chance to sit down and watch these finally. All right, moving over to the documentary feature category, I've got Jane out front. This one won PGA on Saturday. It's the one everybody's talking about this year. 
Faces Place is in, is in second place for me, which is another one that people really like. Icarus I have in third, City of Ghosts, and Last Men in Aleppo in fifth place. And the other, uh, they have uh, 15, I believe is the number here. Uh, Strong Island, LA-92, Inconvenient Sequel, Human Flow, Chasing Coral, Ex Libris, which I've heard a lot of good buzz about, Abacus, One of Us, Lone, Long Strange Trip, excuse me, and Unrest. This one, they go a little less on name value alone and stuff. So uh, LA-92 is one I've heard people talk about. Strong Island, uh, I believe, is a Netflix film, so that one has gotten some appeal. Of course, the original Inconvenient Truth won this category about 10 years ago, or more than 10 years ago, actually. And uh, Ex Libris, I know, was in the discussion very early on, so I might, you know, uh, I might not be totally shocked uh, if Ex Libris gets in. So, um, but I haven't heard enough negative buzz on any of these other five. Uh, I think Icarus is another Netflix one, so, uh, yeah, I'm just sticking with these these five in the meantime. All right, we'll move on. Uh, foreign Film is up next. I have A Fantastic Woman, The Square, Foxtrot, Loveless, and In the Fade here. Uh, really, In the Fade is the one that uh, I know I was originally kind of shaky on, but after it's now won the Globe and Critics' Choice, it looks like it's a pretty easy bet here. Uh, there's only four other ones uh, shortlisted here, The Insult, The Wound, On Body and Soul, and Felicity, and none of those have enough buzz behind them, I don't think, at least. Uh, Loveless, I know, is from the same director as, um, I think it was Leviathan, the Russian one. I think Yeah, because Loveless is from Russia, that's right. And that one won the Globe a few years ago. So they like him, and uh, it, uh, Leviathan was nominated at the Oscars as well. Um, I've heard there's a little bit of negative buzz on Foxtrot, or you know, just some indifference on that one. So that one might fall out in favor of some of the other ones. But again, I haven't heard enough buzz on the other four here to 100% uh, go uh, behind that one. All right, and uh, the last one here we'll talk about before we get into the other uh, big categories where we start to see multiple, multiple nominees, of course, is uh, Animated Feature. I have Coco out front, Loving Vincent, Lego Batman, The Breadwinner, and I put Despicable Me, uh, me uh, I'll try that again, Despicable Me 3 in uh, for my last one here, uh, which, yeah, I'm kind of nervous about that one, but it has been nominated by the Producers Guild and uh, got into DGA for Animated, I believe. Uh, the Guild's been liking that one. And I think I, I originally had this one, too. And, um, again, I kind of mentioned it earlier in the year, but I said they really like the first two Despicable Me movies here. And the second one, and well, actually, no, the first two were, were well-received uh, critically and financially. Plus, this one is over a billion dollars, so it's one of the more popular ones this year. And... Uh, also, when you look at it, you've got like Ferdinand, Mary and the Witch's Flower, ba uh, Boss Baby, excuse me, Captain Underpants, is a few other ones that have gotten some acclaim here and there, a few nominations here and there. But again, I'm not sensing, because Boss Baby, I think, has enough negative buzz that it's not, you know, not going to be a factor here. Captain Underpants, which I saw and I loved, um, is, uh, yeah, it's just the name alone. I don't. They're not going to go for it. They should. It, it's it's a great. Uh, not only is it well animated, but it's it's a really cleverly written uh, film too. Uh, and then Mary and the Witch's Flower. It's uh, kind. Of, I think it's from the same company as The Breadwinner, so I don't see him go, uh, double dipping for them. And uh, Ferdinand, even though the the Globes went for it for film uh, animated and also for original song, uh, it has you know it's it's done okay at the box office, but definitely not the the big hit they were expecting. And it. I don't know, it just doesn't seem to have the resonance power that uh, that some people originally were, were thinking here. Okay, uh, move over now to uh, visual effects. We have War for the Planet of the Apes out front here, Star Wars, uh, The Last Jedi, Blade Runner 2049, I have Shape of Water, and Dunkirk as my five. I don't know, I'm a lot of people are, I think, they're going to miss this one, but a lot of people are taking out Shape of Water. I don't know why. Um... It's, you know, uh, of these five, it's the best chance to win Best Picture. I don't think Dunkirk uh, is as strong as Shape of Water. Um, Dunkirk I could also mi see missing out because it's not big visual effects. It's not a lot of CGI heavy stuff, uh, which occasionally they'll they'll do exclusively in this category. Like we saw, though, Arrival missed out last year. That's, a that's the main argument, by the way. I've been hearing about why Shape of Water won't get in. 
but I don't know. It's Del Toro. Uh, Del Toro. I, didn't Pan's Labyrinth get in for visual effects? I'm pretty sure it did. Hang on, I might... Uh, maybe... <laughs> I could have sworn I remember seeing that was on its nominations. No, it wasn't nominated for visual effects. I don't know. It probably didn't make the short list. That's true. So, um, I don't know. I, I, that was over 10 years ago, so I, I don't know if it did make the short list or not. Maybe it didn't. Or if they even had a short list back then. I, can't, I don't know. So, um, I don't know. But... Uh, they went, uh, actually, they've never dominated a, uh, a Del Toro film, have they? Oh, okay, this argument's starting to make more sense the more I think about it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm oh, I'm not, no, I'm not jumping off that cliff, no. Uh, Shape of Water, is, I'm sticking with that one. Uh, a lot of people have been saying Okja instead, which, again, that's the Netflix thing. I'm, I'm still not betting on Netflix yet. And then after that, it's like you've got uh, four other films shortlisted here. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets, Alien Covenant, and Kong Skull Island. I, I'm just not seeing one lone contender there that can take the rest of them out. Like Kong, I know, got some uh, uh, love from the uh, Visual Effects Guild. Uh, they do like, like Prometheus was nominated here a few years ago, and Ridley Scott films tend to get in. Uh, but again, there's kind of a stink around Alien Covenant, and it wasn't uh, hugely a critically uh, acclaimed film. Valerian was a big flop. They don't usually nominate big flops uh, unless it's I don't know, unless it's a really weak year, which I think the other contenders are really strong here. And Guardians, the original Guardians was nominated for visual effects, but uh, I don't have it getting into makeup either. I just don't think they're going to go for that one. So I think it's because of the lack of other contenders here i think that's why shape of water even if you go with all those other uh theories out there i think it's still safe yeah but um this one i i'm just still hoping to god it's still war for the planet of the apes it takes the win here deserves it very much all right uh move on to the sound categories now we're going to start with sound mixing and i have dunkirk out front uh blade runner in second place star wars in third baby driver in fourth and the post in fifth and I might be kicking myself for that because I just put it back in. I originally had uh, Shape of Water in this fifth slot here. Uh, I took it out because uh, after I saw the post, uh, I looked at it and I'm like, well, over the opening logos you've got sound. Okay, that's a big sign. Uh, the opening five minutes of the movie is all set in Vietnam, uh, which I don't think these are big spoilers I don't mean, you know, by any means. Uh, you've got all the, the press rolling, and you've got and there's multiple scenes of multiple characters talking at the same time. You've got to mix the sound right in that. Plus, when you look at it, it's all Spielberg's usual guys. And we've seen, like, Bird of Spies was a surprise nominee here a few years ago. Uh, War Horse got in here. Lincoln got in here. Spielberg films do very well in this category. So I think this is one I originally had, I originally had the post in here. I kept it for a long time. And then I kind of wussed out and went with Shape of Water. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm putting the post back in. I, I'm going to keep it. I'll keep it, but not extremely confidently. Uh, we look at it. Also, you've got, like, uh, Greatest Showman and Beauty and the Beast. Sometimes they go with musicals in this category. I have Wonder Woman as a possibility. I have that one in sound editing. But uh, they, could, they could go for it for sound mixing, too. War from the Planet of the Apes is one uh, some people are talking about, too. So, uh I'll throw those out as other contenders here, but God, I'm hoping this thing works out. All right, uh, moving over to sound editing. I have uh, Dunkirk out front again here, Blade Runner, Star Wars, Baby Driver, and again, Wonder Woman is my fifth. Again, originally I had Shape of Water, but then Wonder Woman was more fav uh, heavily favored by the guilds for the sound categories here. Uh, War for the Planet of the Apes is another one that's a possibility here. And then again, uh, I think I mentioned it the other day, only the Brave too. Uh, but, uh, again, I'm not hearing a lot of buzz around the movie. Too bad. It's, it's one of the year's best. Everybody missed the boat on that one. Okay, so that one I think is a little, a little easier. All right, moving on to the music categories now. Starting with original song, uh, Remember Me from Coco I think is still out front here. No question about that. Mystery of Love from Call Me By Your Name I have in second place. This Is Me, The Greatest Showman, which won the Globe. Uh, Evermore from Beauty and the Beast in fourth place. And Stand Up for Something from Marshall in fifth. I originally did not have this one. I had, um, what was my fifth one? I think Prayers from Syria uh, in there as well originally, but I took that one out uh, because I found out that this is another Diane Warren song, uh, Stand Up for Something. So um, 
Diane Warren, of course, a usual nominee in this category. She should have won actually two years ago, two or was it two or three years ago for the the Lady Gaga song that lost. Uh, that would have been her chance to get an Oscar, but again, they didn't do it. So I think she gets in at least for this. Uh, now the prayers from Syria one or cries from Syria, excuse me, is uh, another one that's a possibility here. They could. I'm still kind of you know I would be ecstatic if they gave this uh, nomination to uh, the Promise. Uh, which is uh, Chris Cornell, the late Chris Cornell. Uh, it's actually a very good song. Uh, you know, I, I know next to nobody saw the movie, but it's uh, it's a really good song that, that is separate from the movie and is really great. And then also Mighty River, because that's Mary J. Blige was behind the song as well. Again, it's the Netflix thing is what's uh, taken me out of that. But uh, it was nominated at the Globes, so that one, it's uh, it's got a possibility. All right, moving on to original score. Uh... Yeah. Okay. So, Shape of Water, I have out front. Phantom Thread, which I saw. Uh, I didn't really give my opinions yet on this, but I thought the Post is a middle of the road Spielberg movie. I didn't particularly love it. I didn't hate it either. Uh, I was kind of kind of indifferent toward most of it, like especially the subplot with um, with uh, Meryl Streep's. Char- well, it's it's kind of weird because she's the main character, and yet her main storyline up until the last act is a subplot. So. Uh, Anyways, but her whole subplot about the uh, the post uh, Washington Post going public, I thought was kind of a snooze, and I was way more interested in Tom Hanks as Ben Bradley and all the other stuff, which is the main plot of the movie, of course. Uh, by the end, though, I did really appreciate Streep's performance. I thought she did a great job, and uh, and in particular, there was that scene in the bedroom with her and Allison Brie, who plays her daughter, and that scene actually really well done, and uh, the music by John Williams. I'm, I don't know, nobody else has been talking about the music from this movie, but did anybody else get the sense, at least from some of it, that it's kind of like a Jurassic Park kind of feel? I don't know, maybe I'm alone in that, but um, yeah. I, so I did like the score, too. I have that one getting in uh, here. And then from Phantom Thread, I don't know what it was. Everybody loves this movie, and it, it, you know, a, a lot of critics in particular that I listen to a lot are saying it's way better than everybody else is saying. I don't, what did I miss? Because, yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of a bore. Yeah, I, I mean, I still liked it. I think uh, the score by Johnny Greenwood is really great. Uh, of course, Danny Day-Lewis gives a good performance, and uh, Vicky Creeps uh, as the uh, the lead female character. She's she's terrific. She holds her own uh, with Daniel Day-Lewis. Kind of reminiscent, actually, of uh, Margot Robbie in Wolf of Wall Street, where you have Leo giving, you know, big dynamic performance, and uh, and she held her, her ground there. The same with uh, Vicky Creeps in this one. And also Leslie Manville, I thought all three of the uh, main characters did a really great job, but it's just that it uh, the movie for me kind of fell off the rails by the time the third act started. It's like we had all this stuff building up, and then it felt like okay, this is the end of the movie, right? But then oh, here's another act, and it uh, it just didn't interest me nearly as much as the first two acts. Uh, I get you know I get the message of the movie is kind of like having to settle for you know in 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 your relationships you're you kind of have to get over your idiosyncrasies and you have to kind of adjust to the other person. I get that that's kind of the message of the movie, but I just felt like it was, um, you know, and and it's got some well-directed moments. Definitely the cinematography is is really great, actually from director uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, but it it just didn't interest me as much as uh, other ones. I did like, you know, because I thought going into it, I'm like, well, I could probably, I'll probably like the movie a lot, but I'll yeah, I don't know how I could ever be fascinated by dressmaking. I, I'm just not one of those people that likes that kind of stuff. But I was like, actually, in the the kind of the first act is the where the most part of the dressmaking stuff comes in. I was like, this is actually really fascinating to watch how he he figures out what he's doing and the sketchbook he has. It's like, yeah, that first act actually I thought was the most entertaining part. And plus, the introduction of the love story was was actually really good. And there's a couple other parts. It gets it, kind of a dark comedy in some parts, especially when we get to the second act. But um, yeah, overall, I was again kind of mixed on it. I like it. I can recommend it. But I, I'm not going to jump up and down and say it's one of the best films of the year. But the score was great, and I think the score gets in. So again, uh, where were we here? Shape of Water, Phantom Thread, Dunkirk, The Post. I'm I'm going with Thomas Newman here. I'm putting in Victoria and Abdul. Because I missed him the year of British Spies. I missed him last year with Passengers. I'm not missing him again. Nope, I'm just not going to do it. Uh, it does pain me, though, because logic suggests that Darkest Hour is actually a much bigger contender here because it's... Uh, uh, God, I just looked up his name. Now I, I don't know. 
But it's the usual composer who worked with Joe Wright, and I looked at it, and he got in for Anna Karenina, he got in for Pride and Prejudice, he got in for Atonement. So whenever a Joe Wright film goes really big with the Oscars, which Darkest Hour, I think, will get some other nominations here, the score gets in. Even Anna Karenina, which wasn't a big Best Picture contender, got in for score. And among, you know, among other uh, awards, it actually won costumes, I believe, too. So, yeah, I'm going against logic there with the Victorian Abdul. But it's like, it's Thomas Newman always gets in. So, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I have that one. And so, uh, but Darkest Hour, it's got to be close. Uh, I can actually see a scenario where Johnny Greenwood could miss uh, for Phantom Thread because uh, he's not as, as familiar with, uh, with the, uh, the music branch there. Uh, can you guys still see me? The one light turned off. Okay, I think we're good. And um, I don't know, but they love Hans Zimmer. That one's set. They love Alexander Desplat. He's set. Those are the two completely safe ones. But I don't... The rest of them could go. Except, again, they, whenever John Williams is up for something, they give it. They give him a nomination, at least. So the post... Yeah, and the same... It's like all these different... Uh, I don't know. This is, this is turning into a, a more complex category than I originally thought. <laughs> Because then you've also got John Williams to the score for The Last Jedi uh, for Star Wars, so that's another possibility. Plus, um, you've got um, uh, three billboards in the conversation, too, for Carter Burwell. He did uh, uh, that one. He got a, a Globe nomination for it. And again, this is another one where uh, if three billboards is going to really, really overperform tomorrow morning, this is one category it could get into. Uh, yeah. Anyways, and then a personal favorite of mine this year was uh, War for the Planet of the Apes. So that's Michael Giacchino. He did a really great job with that score, too. I don't think it'll get in, but it's, it's that's one I wanted to, to mention, at least. All right, uh, we'll move on now to the uh, the two design categories, production design and costume design. Let's move, uh, start with uh, production design, uh, which I think is actually the easier of the two categories here. Uh, Shape of Water I have out front, Blade Runner in second, Dunkirk, Darkest Hour, and Beauty and the Beast. Um... Yeah, now, on the list of other potentials here, we're, I think, uh, we're kind of over or underestimating, excuse me, downsizing, uh, which is one I know it's not going to be a big player in other categories except uh, supporting actress, uh, but it's like when they shrink people down, it's like the world they create there I thought was really great. This is one I liked a lot more than everybody else did. I, I thought it's, uh, I gave it a 9 out of 10. I thought it did, you know, a, a lot with its concept. Uh, even though the third act for me was not quite as interesting as the first two acts, uh, it was still, there's enough great uh, material in there and performances and some witty dialogue and uh, overall a very well explored concept that I, I enjoyed it more than most. Um, Phantom Thread is also a possibility, but when I watch the movie, it's like, I think more of the costumes. I think a hell of a lot less about the, the actual sets and stuff because... Most of that stuff, it's like, okay, well, it's the same house, just put a different table in or uh, different um, different appliances and stuff like that. Uh, Greatest Showman is one that is also uh, in the discussion here, but uh, I don't know. It's it's another one to where some of the sets are CGI'd in, I believe, so that one I think could get a strike against them. And also The Post is one I've seen a few people going for here, but... Uh, Again, it's kind of like, except for a few of the interior design stuff, it's like most of it looks, you know, pretty standard. All right, uh, costume design. I have uh, Phantom Thread up front here, followed by Beauty and the Beast, The Greatest Showman, Shape of Water, and Darkest Hour. So uh, I could flip out, because Darkest Hour... Flip out. <laughs> uh, interchange here, because uh, Victorian Abdul, I think, is, is a threat in this category. Murder on the Orient Express is a threat in this category. If The Beguiled, which I know early on some people thought would be a, a bigger player and like director and some of the acting races and stuff, it could score a nomination here. It could. Uh, it's not the wildest theory in the world. I, Tanya got in at BAFTA for costume design, of all things. So that's another one to mention here. Uh, the only other one I think uh, could get in is if, for whatever reason, if Dunkirk really scores big at the Oscars tomorrow, Maybe costume design. Maybe they, they uh, go with a wild slot there for costumes. But, uh, yeah, I'll stick with these five. But, again, if now that I've taken Darkest Hour out of score, I can, yeah, maybe I'll start considering maybe taking that one out of a couple of these other ones because I have it in for cinematography, too. Uh, but one thing I know for sure <laughs> that Darkest Hour is going to get in for tomorrow is makeup, and I have that one out front here. I, I don't see a scenario where the other contenders take it down. Uh, Wonder I have in there as well, and Itania in third place. Uh, so, 
Uh, the other four on the short list here are Guardians, Volume 2, Bright, Victoria and Abdul, and Ghost in the Shell. Uh, yeah, I, like I said, I don't think Ghost in the Shell is going to be a big contender here. I think Bright, uh, there's a lot of negative buzz around it, just, you know, word of mouth. And then also it's a Netflix film, so I think that takes, that, you know, doesn't completely leave it out of the discussion because it's another David Ayer film, and it's, uh, you know, he just, his film, of course, Suicide Squad just won last year, so that's uh, one to consider. Uh, the original Guardians made it in, so that's uh, a possibility. Now, the thing with me, Victoria and Abdul, is, yeah, there's a little bit of makeup stuff in the film uh, on Judy Dench, but I think most of it was just her, though. Because I think she did, like, there's a, a, a bit where she had to gain weight, I think, a little bit. And the rest of it, I think, was pretty standard. So I don't know. Then again, it's like, uh, what was, I, I just thought of one that got nominated here. It was like two years ago, I think. Uh it was the same thing. It was like they put a little bit of makeup on and it got nominated, but uh, whatever it was, I can't remember it now. So uh, they could go with it, but I, I think the other uh, uh, three contenders here that I have in, Darkest Hour, Wonder, and I, Tanya, are much, much better options here. All right, moving on now, uh, film editing. Uh, okay, let's get this one going. Dunkirk I have out front, uh, Get Out in second place, The Shape of Water in third, Three Billboards in fourth, I'm going with Itania in fifth. I'm going with Itania here. This is one where okay, I went with uh, I went with kind of more of a logics thing on the score thing. This time I'm going with my heart. I'm going with my heart on this one. I I love the movie Itania, one of the best edited films of the year. And I know they don't specifically look for it, but um, but when it comes to like the politics of this year, Itania is edited by a woman. So, you know, if that gets around, which I think it, uh, it's gotten around enough, I think, to where uh, some people have uh, been talking about it. But, uh, yeah, that looks good to have a female competitor in there for editing. At the same case, it goes for cinematography with uh, uh, Rachel Meadows, I think is her name, or something like that, for Mudbound. But, again, the Netflix thing uh, makes me reconsider that one. So I did take Blade Runner out. Uh, I've also got Baby Driver left out, which is, oh, boy, th those two... Uh, could be close. Uh, I haven't seen uh, I haven't seen Blade Runner, but uh, uh, everybody I talked to they said yeah, film editing is is probably uh, a good bet there. And of course, Baby Driver uh, tied with Dunkirk Critics Choice. It is a well edited film. I have it getting into the uh, sound categories there, so it's definitely a threat here. Also, the post. Uh, there's a couple spots in the post that I was like, yep, there's Michael Kahn <laughs> doing his magic. So that one, and uh, one more to throw out here is Lady Bird. Uh, again, uh, I think I've said it a couple times now, but Lady Bird, if it's gonna be a bigger Best Picture contender than we're thinking, if it gets if it gets in over three billboards or in over Itania or even Shape of Water or even Get Out, uh, then we know it's it's a much be, uh, much better contender than we were originally thinking. It might make me uh, reconsider uh, some stuff up at the uh, the top categories, maybe maybe, but uh, anyways. Yep, so those are my five. Uh, yeah, I I'm nervous, but I'm kind of, I'll be, I'll be, yeah, I'll be more happy with myself if I, if I uh, predict I, Tanya and it gets in, then I will, then, uh, yeah, I'll be happier there than I will be disappointed. I'll be extremely disappointed if I say change out to Baby Driver and then I, Tanya gets in, then I'll be really pissed. So, yeah, I would, I'll, uh, I'll go the happy route on that one. Okay, then for cinematography, I have uh, Blade Runner out front here, Dunkirk I have getting in, Shape of Water, Three Billboards, and Darkest Hour. Again, Darkest Hour is one I've seen. It, uh, the opening shot, already it's like right from the opening scene, it's like, yep, okay, this is going to be a cinematography. It, it's a, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, shit, the guy who did, uh, um, he does a lot of Coen Brothers movies. Uh, but he gets in all the time, so I think they, they go with him there. Um, yeah, I know uh, not everybody's going with three billboards here, but uh, I think it it got a, a BAFTA nod, so I think it's got strength there. Uh, but yeah, the two other ones I'm considering here are Call Me By Your Name and Mudbound. Again, the Mudbound thing, just I think the Netflix thing hurts it. Uh, and then also Call Me By Your Name. There's a lot of good long shots in there, too. And some uh, there's some good camera work in there, so that it could get in, but... Uh, I don't know. I'm just not sure if that movie's going to resonate below the line, uh, below the, the screenplay line here. All right, so speaking of screenplays, let's talk about uh, adapted screenplay. I have Call Me By Your Name out front there. 
Molly's Game in second, Disaster Artist in third, Wonder in fourth, and Last Flag Flying in fifth. I'm keeping Last Flag Flying, damn it. I'm doing it. Even though, yeah, I wasn't too hot on the movie. Um, I, I'm just looking at all the contenders here. Again, with Mudbound, the Netflix thing, that's what's taking me out of it. Nothing else. It's just just because it's on Netflix uh, is the reason I'm not going with it. But uh, I'm not seeing a big enough contender here that's, you know, by itself that's going to stand out, that's going to take take down one of the slots here. Like Logan got a WGA nomination, but then again, so did Deadpool. Look where that ended up. Uh, the Beguiled in here is, is uh, an adapted as well, but uh, hasn't really gotten a lot of credit for its screenplay. All the Money in the World is another one. It's, um, again, not a lot of credit going to the screenplay there. I think it's actually one of the weaker elements of the movie, and uh, it hasn't gotten nominated anywhere else. Uh, Victoria and Abdul is another one people are talking about, but again, no big nominations for that one. And then Blade Runner as well. Again, I'm not sensing it for, it's. I'm not seeing enough, uh, sense or enough strength behind any of these other ones to take down any of the other five. Uh, Last Flag Flying, though, again, my main one here is just Richard Linklater uh, as the screenwriter here. He and uh, I think the original author also uh, gets a uh, credit there. So I think that's that's the reason I'm keeping it there. Uh, but uh, that, that category is just, it's just going to be a doozy this year no matter what. <laughs> Anyways. All right, now original screenplay. Here we go. Three billboards out front. Uh, Get Out, Lady Bird, Shape of Water. I'm doing it. I, Tanya. Yep, I'm doing the, the Dallas Buyers Club thing. I mentioned that a few videos ago. So yeah, I pulled out the post. I originally had the post in there. I pulled it out and I said, okay, I'm putting in the big sick. And I looked at it again. I'm like, oh, God, again, it's uh, I'm going with my heart over my brain with, uh, with I, Tanya here. Because I looked at it, I'm like... Uh, I don't know. It's like the big sick. Okay, it got in at SAG Ensemble. Sure. It didn't win anything there. Uh, Holly Hunter, I think, does get in tomorrow for Supporting Actress, but where else is the love for this movie? I'm just not seeing, like, you know, obviously film editing, I think, is not happening. Um, it's not going to happen for, like, any of the other ones, like any of the sound categories or uh, any of the design categories, anything like that. It's not getting in for director. I don't think Kumail's got enough support for lead actor. Ray Romano originally, I thought, would have a better chance for supporting actor, but he's just gotten totally skunked this year. I'm just not seeing enough love for the movie for it to, to get it here. Uh, it is a WGA nominee, but then again, so is Itania. Itania also got a lot better flavor from BAFTA. The Big Sick got nothing at BAFTA. And the Globes. The Globes went, uh, just totally gave it a goose egg for the Big Sick, which if any one uh, uh, guild or award show or whatever this year was going to get behind a movie. I would have thought the Globes and Big Sick. I thought that would be a great pairing, but they they went with other stuff. So, yeah, that and then plus Itania has been on a roll lately. Allison Janney looks like she's a sure bet now for supporting actress. Margot Robbie looks like she's going to fit into the fifth slot there for best actress. And, um, yeah, I think uh, everything else is lining up for the movie, including that film editing. Hopefully that works out. But, yeah, but yeah, I, I'm going to be... Uh, a little, well, not upset, but a little um, disappointed in myself if Big Sick does get in. The same with the post. I think it's, the screenplay's not terrible, but it's it's just not really as in-your-face as Spotlight's script was. Um, and uh, sometimes Spielberg does miss out on the screenplay category here. Uh, I don't know, Bridge of Spies did get in, though. But that was, that was, that was a weaker year, though. Uh, Darkest Hour is the one Anthony McCartan got in for Theory of Everything, so he's a threat. Phantom Thread, they love Paul Thomas Anderson in this category, but again, I don't think Phantom Thread's resonating the way that uh, some of his other films have. And, yeah, there, you know, like Baby Driver, Dunkirk, um, what was the other one I was going to mention? Um, Wind River, yeah, some of these other ones that are real, real outside shots that really have not resonated big time this year. Uh, yeah, I, I won't... Yeah, I'm not saying they're 100% going to be uh, wild cards here, but uh, I don't know. I'll just mention them just to mention them at least. Okay, uh, let's move on now to the uh, supporting acting category, starting with supporting actress. Yep, like I said, it's Alice Janney from here on out. Laurie Metcalf is in there as well. Holly Hunter gets in. I'm going to Octavia Spencer and Hong Chow. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not going with Mary J. Blige. I'm not going with uh, Netflix thing. Plus, Mary did miss out at uh, at BAFTA, too. So there's a little more evidence than just the uh, the non-Netflix thing. Otherwise, then this category gets really weird because it's like it's those six that have, you know, they have to fit five in, but where else do they go here? 
Um, because yeah, I don't think they go with Leslie Manville. She's good in the movie, but she doesn't have, you know, she doesn't have that big, big, big scene uh, where she gets to totally shine. Uh, Tiffany Haddish has gotten a few critics uh, notices here and there, like especially uh, uh, New York uh, film critics. But otherwise, she's been very, very hit and miss. Uh, she got a Critics' Choice nomination and, a few, like I said, a few other uh, regional awards, but that was about it. Um, Kristen Scott Thomas, I did see Darkest Hour recently, too. Uh, that one's another one I was lukewarm on. Uh, there's a couple scenes, especially in the last, uh, half hour or so that I was like, these are really cliched scenes. Like the subway scene. I know some people love the movie and they really like that scene. I hated that subway scene or the underground scene, whatever you want to call it. It was just so cliched and so predictable. I was like, ugh, what are we watching this for? <laughs> like, why is this a part of the movie? So, uh, otherwise I, I thought the strengths of the movie were really in its technical stuff, especially in the first, uh, the first, uh, half. But uh, Kristen, uh, Kristen Scott, uh, if I can say her name, Kristen Scott Thomas, though, is good. Uh, especially, yeah, Gary Oldman, of course, he always does a great job, but uh, yeah. So I, Kristen Scott Thomas, I'll also throw out there as a real wild card here, because she did get a BAFTA nomination. Sure, early on, I had her in as well, but I just don't think there's enough support behind that movie to get it two acting uh, nominations. Okay, supporting actor. This one has turned into the, the most unpredictable of who's going to get in. Uh, originally, I thought it was going to be Best Actress, but no, original, or uh, original, sorry, original screenplay is another one that's tough. But uh, supporting actor has been a very fluid race here, as we've seen through all the precursors. I don't think we've seen any two big precursor award shows that have matched five for five what their uh, supporting actors are. Because BAFTA went with Christopher Plummer and uh, Willem Dafoe, Sam Rockwell, uh, Woody Harrelson, and Hugh Grant, who's a non-factor, of course. Uh, the Globes went with uh, Plummer, Richard Jenkins, Defoe, Sam Rockwell, and Army Hammer. Uh, Critics' Choice threw Michael Stuhlbarg in there. They did not have Woody Harrelson or Christopher Plummer. Uh, oh, what else? Uh, I'm trying to think what else. Um, SAG, yeah, SAG went with Sam Rockwell, Defoe, Jenkins, uh, Harrelson, and Steve Carell, who, again, I don't think Steve Carell is going to get in here. So it's like, damn, there's no... <laughs> No, yeah, none of them have lined up 100%, so that makes it kind of tough. Now, uh, again, I'm going with Rockwell here. I'm going with Defoe, Jenkins, Army Hammer, and Woody Harrelson, uh, which are the five at SAG minus Steve Carell and put in Army Hammer in there. Um, I'm Yeah, again, I'm not going with Christopher Plummer. I kind of reasoned that last time I said, uh, you know, because especially the week of voting, all the money in the world was back into the conversation in the controversial way because of the wage disparagement between... Uh, uh, Michelle Williams and um, uh, can't think of the guy's name, Mark Wahlberg, uh, which I know that you know Christopher Plummer's name doesn't come up directly in that, but it was during the reshoots, and who were they reshooting the movie for? Chris Plummer. So I think he got hurt by that. Plus the movie overall, I think got hurt by that because it's like okay, you get over one controversy by replacing Kevin Spacey, and then right as soon as you do, here comes another controversy. It's just it just wasn't gonna line up for this movie, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'll say Stuhlbarg, uh, he's got a, a, a wild slot, kind of, you know, kind of a, you know, thousand to one shot, but he, he could do it. I mean, like I've been saying it all year, but it's like, uh, it's really difficult because I don't see if he gets in, I think Army Hammer's out or Woody Harrelson's out. I don't see it being, okay, Sam Rockwell gets in, Woody Harrelson gets in, Army Hammer gets in, Stuhlbarg gets in, and then it's Defoe as the fifth. No, I don't see it being two films get two slots each here. Um, yeah, really, Stuhlbarg, I mean, like I said, he's, uh, his best scenes are at the very end, and if you're not on board with the movie by then, you've already taken out your screener if you're voting on this, or you're just, you know, you're, you've already checked out, so, yeah, uh, too bad, because, yeah, he, he does a really, I mean, that speech is powerful stuff, and it's definitely, uh, from what I've seen, because I haven't seen everything he's been in, but it's like, from what I've seen that he's been in, especially this year, I, that, God damn, that's the strongest stuff he's done. But yeah, that's that's a very, very uh, powerful scene, too. Uh, one of the best scenes in the movie. And it's uh, it's a movie that's really, because uh, I saw it about a month ago now, it's really growing on me, and some of the scenes are sticking with me. Uh, some scenes I don't wish would stick with me, the peach scene. But uh, but that speech, man, that, I mean, it's almost a tear-jerking scene. It is that damn good. Um, otherwise, I think, yeah, some people, I know Michael Shannon is getting a little bit of love for Shape of Water, but he hasn't really landed a, a big, uh, nomination anywhere. 
Ray Romano is another one. Uh, Patrick Stewart did get a Critics' Choice nomination, but that didn't stick uh, as, as as well. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's these five. And again, I think we can explain away Stuhlbarg and Christopher Plummer. So, uh, yeah, otherwise, but I, I will not be totally shocked if Plummer gets in because that's another one. He was deliciously evil in that movie. So, um, yeah. If we're just going by strength of performance, by the way, for my personal preference, I think you put uh, Plummer in. Uh, take Harrelson out because, yeah, I love the movie, Three Billboards. Like I said, it's my favorite of the year. But he, in particular, doesn't get, you know, like the big strong scenes that Rockwell does or the big character arc that Rockwell does. Defoe is is phenomenal. Jenkins does a great job. Army Hammer, I think, is, is really great, too. But uh, I don't know. I might swap Stool Bargain for him, for me personally, if I was picking these five, uh, uh, if I was deciding the Oscars. So that's another video. I should do that sometime. Because I've seen, like, yeah, just about every one of these top contenders. I should go, I should do that sometime. Just sit down and say, okay, if I personally, for my personal preferences, were nominating each of the categories, this is how I would do it. But uh, uh, that's something maybe I'll put on the back burner. Okay, uh, moving on now to the lead categories. Starting with lead actress, Frances McDormand out front here, Saoirse Ronan I have in second, uh, Sally Hawkins in third, Meryl Streep in fourth, and Margot Robbie in fifth. I don't know. Uh, these five, I mean, again, kind of like uh, supporting actor all, all across the different award shows, except for the Globes, none of these five have ever uh, gotten in to the same races because BAFTA did not put Meryl Streep in. They put Annette Benning in. Uh, SAG went with Judy Dench over Meryl uh, again. But it's Meryl Streep. You never, ever bet against Meryl Streep. I had to learn that the hard way back with the uh, August Osage County year. So, um, yeah. So uh, I, I learned my lesson there, never bet against Streep. Hopefully I'm learning that lesson this year with Thomas Newman, never bet against Newman. Uh, but yeah, if we do look at other contenders here, uh, Nicole Kidman has been on a roll this year on the TV side for Big Little Lies. I haven't seen that uh, series yet. It's, a, it's it's something I'm putting on the list. I'll watch it eventually. But uh, but she's been winning every award show, which uh, you know, which a lot of the voters do watch. So they say, oh, okay, well, she's in The Beguiled, which I, I don't know if a lot of them have seen it. So... Maybe just by name recognition, she gets an outside shot. And then also Victoria and Abdul for Judy Dench. She is a legend, uh, and she's been nominated multiple places, so she's one to consider. Uh, but when BAFTA didn't even put her in, that was troubling. And also Jessica Chastain, who kind of like um, uh, Miss Sloan last year, she got in at Globes. Um, she got into Critics' Choice, right? I think that was it. Because, yeah, she didn't. I don't think she was in for Critics' Choice last year for Miss Sloan, but that's pretty much the same model there. But, uh, but yeah, I think uh, Molly's Game will get into adapted screenplay there, so it's not a total loss for the film. Okay, uh, lead actor, I'm going with Gary Oldman, Darkest Hour, uh, Timothee Chalamet, Daniel Day-Lewis, James Franco, and Daniel Kaluuya. I don't really see, uh, again, we've mentioned it with Franco several times here, uh, and it's it's been weird. It's a weird year overall, because, number one, when I saw Get Out back in March of last year, I was like, I was like, okay, I can see if it comes down to the Oscars, if this is going to get even one nomination, it's going to be screenplay, which I didn't even predict screenplay for a long, long time. I don't think it was until December before I started predicting it for screenplay. Uh, but I never would have dreamt out of that first screening in a million years that Daniel Kaluuya was going to get a Best Actor nomination. No way in hell. Not because he's not deserving. And, you know, personally, again, if I'm filling out my five, I think Jake Gyllenhaal definitely deserves a slot here for Stronger. Uh, Franco does a really great job. This, you know, despite of you know the sexual allegation stuff. Again, I separate that from the performance, and I don't think the performance should be penalized uh, because of what the person does. Obviously, that has you know, obviously the politics of it has hurt other actors before, like Russell Crowe. Obviously, that year, uh, and he's not been nominated since, I believe. So that was a big one. Um, of course, there was kind of like Peter O'Toole always had a bad reputation. Dustin Hoffman did. He, he won two Oscars, but, uh, you know, he wasn't exactly heavily favored in the early years of the Academy there when he was getting in for, like, Midnight Cowboy and The Graduate. And I remember he was really pissed when he didn't win for either of those. Or, or there was, uh, I've heard a little bit of spattering of that, especially since he's been in the news lately. But, um, yeah, and uh, uh, Richard Burton was another one. You know, they, they kind of off-screen had these big personalities that were not extremely favored. Uh, Judy Garland is, is another big prime example. Uh, so, you know, it's been known to happen before to where, yeah, they'll get nominated, but they don't win. So I think that's the case with Franco again this year. I th And again, that scandal hit 
just, I think, just a hair too late for it to totally affect his nomination because that was Thursday uh, morning when that came out. The ballots were due that next, uh, the next day on Friday. So I would say a good balance of those ballots had James Franco on them by the time they were submitted before that hit. And then after it hit, there might still be, because like I said, uh, I'm not, I haven't seen a big, big spot of evidence for this yet, but I think there's some people in the Academy, especially in the kind of stake eaters, kind of tech categories. I think there's some men out there in the Academy who feel that they're, they're kind of on the chopping block this year and they feel a little persecuted. So they might say, ah, oh, screw it. I'm still putting James Franco down. I, I, I don't know. I, like I said, I'm not sympathizing with them at all. I'm not arguing their case at all, but I'm saying that might be a, a, a scenario that helps James Franco out. Uh, personally, again, if you're separating the performance from the, the person too, if like me, I would still put Franco's name down. I probably would. Um, it's close though, because he's good. Uh, I don't know. Daniel Day-Lewis, he's good in Phantom Threat. I don't think he impressed me enough as, uh, or as much, I should say, as Gary Oldman or Timothée Chalamet did. So those two are for sure. Uh, and then Franco, I would say, I would put him in there. I would put, uh, Jake Gyllenhaal in there. And then, um... I don't know. I really liked uh, 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 two. Uh, I'll name off here: Josh Brolin in, in Only the Brave. He got really uh, underrated for that. He did a really magnificent job, and also um, Jeremy Renner from Wind River. If I was voting on these personally, so um, yeah. So maybe I don't know. Maybe Franco does get kicked out then. But uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, it's it's been a weird year in that case too. But. Uh, but yeah, I think Kaluuya does get in. He's he hit everywhere. Franco hit everywhere he could, except uh, BAFTA. Uh, Day Lewis hit everywhere except SAG, and the other two were everywhere. So yeah, I think that's the way that's going to go. Uh, now, as far as other uh, possibilities, I did name Christian Bale at one point, but I'm not seeing a lot of strength for him. Uh, Tom Hanks he hit a few places here and there. Denzel hit uh, SAG and Globes, and uh, he well he missed Critics Choice, so he he's kind of hit and miss. Gyllenhaal only had Critics' Choice, so I think he's out. Um, yeah, I think that's that's going to be about it. Okay, now moving on to Director. I'm sticking with the DGA on this one. I'm going Guillermo del Toro, Christopher Nolan, Martin McDonough, Greta Gerwig, and Jordan Peele. I think that's, that's the way it's going to go. Um, yeah, the thing is, because uh, I've seen a lot of support for, uh, excuse me, for Spielberg and for Luke Guadagnino and uh, Sean Baker's name been, uh, has been mentioned a lot more late, uh, recently. Denis Villeneuve, Paul Thomas Anderson, a few of these other ones. I just don't see enough support behind one name that's going to topple Jordan Peele or topple Greta Gerwig, God forbid, because then, okay, we're going to get a lot of stuff. And, you know, I was reflecting on it because I was thinking about it. I'm like, Lady Bird is one. I watched it once, and I, I liked it a lot. But I remember I was, like, thinking about it, I'm like, Personally, what I put her in for director, and I'm, I'm thinking about it, I'm like, well, technically, you know, as far as the filmmaking goes, there's nothing special about it. But the performances, the way she uh, directed her performers and uh, the way she directed her actors, there was no bad performance in the movie. So for me, like, I, the same last year with, like, Kenneth Lonergan, who I thought uh, did a great job and deserved uh, the director nomination last year, sometimes if you can direct your actors well enough that even if the tech stuff doesn't matter – but you can still direct your actors in a way that they give such great, sometimes career-high performances, you deserve to be in the conversation or you deserve a slot. So in that respect, plus, like I, I think I mentioned it right after I saw the movie too, but it's like the last uh, the last scene with Laurie Metcalf, uh, which is kind of a mini, a mini spoiler for the movie, so I won't fully describe the scene, but it's like her last kind of big full scene uh, where she's driving the car, uh, for whatever reason, that struck me when that happened. I was like, that's one of the best directed scenes of the year. So that one, for whatever reason, uh, caught my uh, caught my fancy. But um, yeah, so I think uh, it's a tough year because there's a lot of great uh, directorial achievements this year. Uh, yeah, for me personally, I don't know if I would put her in. I can't confidently say I would because I would put McDonough in. I'd put El Toro in for sure. i put Jordan Peele in there. Again, that's uh, Jordan Peele I put in more for the, the screenplay part of it, but... Uh, but still, very well-crafted screenplay, and he directed it uh, as well as he could, for sure. And especially as a first-time director, too. Damn, that's that's an impressive job. Uh, so those three, for sure. I don't know if I would put Nolan in, because I, I didn't like Dunkirk as much as everybody else. <sighs> it's close. I didn't think there was anything special about The Post, especially for Spielberg, even though he is a great director, of course. Uh, Sean Baker, The Last Five Minutes of Florida Project. I liked 
okay. Not as, you know, there's some people that absolutely hate the movie because of the last five minutes, but that was, that was his choice. So, but the rest of it, I think he directed beautifully. So I think he uh, gets entered into the conversation. Um, uh, for me personally, Ter- Taylor Sheridan should be a much higher uh, component in this. Wind River is phenomenal. Uh, and then also that's another first time directing uh, one too. So yeah, I'm thinking uh, with this one, um, God, it's tough for my personal preference. It's really tough to nail this down to five, but I think that there's enough out there that these, these five get in. And again, I can't really name one particular individual here, except Spielberg has the best shot, but uh, also Ridley Scott. We didn't mention Ridley Scott. He's, he's an outside contender for uh, having to do all the reshoots. But again, I think because, the wage uh, gap thing really hurt the movie. I think that also affects that. Plus, if Ridley Scott had known about it, and he has made some comments since saying, I, I wouldn't have, you know, saying he didn't encourage it. But I think uh, that, that's another thing you can kind of not hold him 100% responsible for, but definitely something that uh, his name could get dragged into that same way Plumbers does. So, yeah, I, there's enough evidence against all the other ones. I'm not seeing one individual who has everything else going for him. Like, uh, like I see that with Itania in screenplay, there's enough going for it to go- get over on some of these other ones. Same with editing for Itania, there's enough going for it to get over on other contenders. I'm not seeing that on one particular candidate and director. Okay, so then we're going over to picture. Uh, three billboards out front, Lady Bird, Get Out, Shape of Water, Call Me By Your Name, The Post, Dunkirk, uh, Big Sick, Itania, and Darkest Hour are the ten I have in. Uh, but uh, Florida Project, I think it's still got a decent shot of getting into picture. And if it does get a picture slot or it gets a director slot, I think we have to start considering maybe Defoe has a little bit of strength to him. Because if for sure if the movie gets in, then, then okay, that means they watched it and they probably really liked it and they liked Defoe in it for sure. If he, I, I think he's safe for nomination. But Sam has won everything else, though. So I think I would still bet on Sam, but I would say Defoe will, will drag more votes away, especially since Woody's in the category, too, if that works out. But... Uh, Anyways, um, then again, we did see last night at SAG, even with Woody in the category, Sam still won. So, uh, Phantom Thread's another one. Again, I don't know if it'll get that passionate 5% of the popular vote to, uh, to break into Best Picture. The Big Sick, I'm starting, the more I'm thinking about that one, the more I'm like, uh, that one could fall out. I, Tanya, I think, uh, the passion is there. I think it could... If they if they land on eight nominees, I think Itani is the eighth because I think the other seven are you know Dunkirk, Post, Call Me by Your Name, Shape of Water, Get Out, Lady Bird, Three Billboards, one hundred percent those are happening. Uh, they go up to ten. I think the lowest number of Best Picture nominees they'll have is seven in this case. Uh, if there's not enough for Itania, not enough for Darkest Hour, not enough for The Big Sick, then I think they'll land it at seven for sure. Itania, if they go with eight, Itania gets in. If they go with nine, I think it probably lands on Darkest Hour. If they go with 10, it's either the Big Sick or the Florida Project, uh, which I would probably say the Big Sick has performed better overall across the season. So uh, Big Sick probably gets the advantage there. The Florida Project, actually, the more I'm thinking about it, could be close. It could be very close here. Otherwise, yeah, like I said, Phantom Thread, I don't see enough uh, behind it. Wonder Woman, not enough behind it. Uh, Disaster Artist, not enough behind it. Molly's Game did get a PGA nomination, but again, I don't think there's enough passion support behind it. Uh, and I think Chastain would have to be uh, a sure bet for uh, for Best Actress, but that's not happening. Um, maybe if it had a supporting actor candidate, maybe it would be a, a better uh, prediction there. Uh, or if it got director, or if it had you know more support there, then I think it would be a, a much higher profile contender. But at the main, in the meantime, I think uh, I think I've said my piece on that. All right. So, folks, this is what it all comes down to. It's it's the last day. Uh, okay, now that I've done this video, uh, this this is all done. I'm not going to make any more changes because that's not fair for me to come in the next day. And if I get another one right, I'm like, well, yeah. Anyway, I know, I know. It, it's kind of a thing. But still, I, I'm setting my deadline now. This is it. I'm done. I'm not making any more changes. All the changes I've made are final. This is it. No question about it. So, um, yeah. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, we'll see how, how badly this, this turns out tomorrow. So, uh I'll be up early like a lot of other people will. Uh, good luck, first of all, to all the uh, people, especially recently uh, subscribers here. Thank you for uh, finding my channel and uh, and watching the videos as far as you do. I don't care if you watch for the first five seconds, turn it off, or if you watch all the way through. doesn't matter. You're still uh, 
I'm uh, still a, a very valued viewer. I'm very appreciative of that. Appreciative of all the comments, people saying, oh, I got this one wrong, or oh, you know, uh, this, that, and all the other stuff. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm thankful to all you guys for uh, doing that. And I would have never thought I would ever get uh, 73 people, because that's the number of subscribers I have right now, at least. Uh, you know, if, if all of you guys joined up in a room, I was like, I would never know if just this YouTube little small operation thing, I don't know if I would ever get a room full of people who would even come to watch, but it's 73. Wow. Okay, so um, very thankful to you guys for tuning in. Tomorrow is a big day. Uh, I'm not going to have all the time in the world tomorrow to talk about stuff, so I'll... Uh, Especially, yeah, since we do have uh, that little break in there after they do the first bunch of nominations, they'll have like, a, I think it was 16 or, well, it's 16 minutes between when they start and when the second half starts. So it's like, depending on how long that first half takes, which I would guess can't be more than six minutes. So, okay, we'll have probably a 10 minute break in there. A 10 minute break, I can probably talk about all the other stuff that happens in those categories, talk about what I missed, what I got right and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, so... Yeah, like I said, I don't have a whole, whole, whole bunch of time tomorrow to talk about every last category. So um, so if I have to duck out early, I can come back and do a second part later if I need to. So, um, yeah. But yeah, good luck. If you're predicting these tomorrow, good luck. I mean, if you got a 100 to 1 or a 1,000 to 1 shot that you want to go for, I mean, you can go for it, sure. You know, and, and you, know, you can brag about it later. Like right now... Uh, at least for when we're talking about the actual race of Best Picture, three billboards after the win last night. It also won the uh, more Globes than any other film this year. Uh, it was, uh, I would say, it was probably in the in the top discussion part there for PGA. Uh, Shape of Water did win that, and it also won Critics' Choice. But right now, if I, I'd be so happy with myself if I could say, back in November, like, and I, I was pro it was the second. Uh, actually, let me. Uh, I don't have it written down here, but let me go back here. Because it was the second Saturday. In November, it was November 11th. It was uh, Veterans Day. Is when I put three billboards out front. And that was before anybody put three billboards out front. Unless you were somebody who saw it at uh, Toronto. And then it won it won the Audience Award there. So, yeah, early on. It's, it's not like this is a movie that's been divisive from day one. It's been divisive since that bullshit campaign started. Which I, I, And I, I say bullshit campaign because I personally don't agree with it. I don't, I don't uh, agree with the reasoning behind it, but uh, obviously if you had problems with the film, that's cool. If you didn't like it as much as I did, that's cool. That's, you know, that's, that's life. And, uh, you know, I don't want to get in, I hope I don't uh, drag out on this, but uh, without getting into that full discussion again, uh, I think a lot of people that are just going with this uh, smear campaign, because I think that's, that's what it is. It's just a smear campaign. The same thing that happened to Zero Dark Thirty. Uh, uh, amongst uh, mother, many other contenders uh, through the years here. But that one is probably one of the more recognizable ones. Um, you know, but it, I think it's a smear campaign just because maybe you just don't like Three Billboards as much as Lady Bird or Get Out or Shape of Water and some of these other contenders. Uh, which, to those people, I have to say, guys, if you're putting your personal opinions into this, you have to realize that your favorite movie of the year, one of your favorites, not winning Best Picture or even getting nominated for Best Picture... That comes with the territory, guys. That happens every year. Uh, for me, 2015, uh, Mistress America was my favorite film of the year. Didn't get a Best Picture nomination. I never I never cried anything over that. I never cried foul over it. I said it should have been nominated, but it didn't have enough traction behind it, so I'm not like I was not like totally shocked and upset and throwing stuff, uh, which if Three Billboards does win this year, there'll definitely be people throwing stuff. There'll definitely be people getting all pissed off and over overexcited about it. Um... Uh, my second favorite film that year was Steve Jobs. That didn't land uh, a Best Picture nomination. It, it got two acting nominations, but that's better than Mr. America did. That got nothing. Um, and uh, the year of Skyfall, when that didn't get nominated, that was one of my three favorite films of that year. I didn't throw a big fuss. Uh, last year, Edge of Seventeen, which for me personally, okay, we're not to be a total dick about it, but... If Lady Bird, which is, you know, you've got like Natalie Portman and some of these other people coming out and saying, this is the film I've been waiting for, you know, a female perspective about coming of age and all that, uh, it's the first film to do that. It's like, where the fuck were you guys when Edge of Seventeen came out last year? That was written and directed by a female, from the female perspective, big time, and it was, for me, way better than Lady Bird, way more impactful than Lady Bird, and uh, should have been in the conversation more than Lady Bird is right now. But, hey, that's the way it goes. I'm not, you know, I'm not totally, I'm not throwing stuff, but I'm, I'm just saying, 
where were you guys when that one came out? It got a Globe nomination for Haley Steinfeld, who should have been an, an actress nominee that year for sure. She gave one of the best performances of the year, uh, regardless. But, uh, yeah, I, I I didn't throw a huge fuss. I wasn't all you know pounding on stuff, pissed off on Oscar nomination when I got nothing, because the expectations were set. Right now, the expectations are kind of half set on three billboards winning Best Picture. So you have to, you know... If those are the expectations, if those are what the signs are pointing for, you have to keep that in mind. You have to at least be prepared for it. You don't, uh, anyways. So, so yeah, with all that stuff of your personal taste and stuff, you have to remember that your favorite movie not winning is not, you know, the Academy pointing and laughing at you. It's, it comes with the territory. It comes with the territory. Every year, there's a movie or two that I really love. Like for me this year, Wind River is not going to get anything tomorrow. Uh, Only the Brave is probably not going to get anything tomorrow. War for the Planet of the Apes, one of my favorite films of the year, is probably looking at one nomination, maybe two, if it's lucky. Um, Yeah, I mean, Get Out, for me, is one of my favorites as well that's in my top five. Uh, That one, it's going to land five nominations. I don't necessarily think it's going to get more, but, you know, that comes with the territory. Some of your favorite films are not going to line up 100%. So... Yeah, anyway, so, yeah, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox now. That's all I'm going to say on that. But, uh, anyways, um, yeah, so just remember that, too. Uh, don't set your expectations way too high for your personal preferences if they haven't already had that expectation. Like, for me, if Argo had lost Best Picture that year, with all the expectations of it winning PGA, winning DGA, winning SAG, winning uh, Golden Globes, winning Critics' Choice, winning BAFTA, if it had lost Best Picture, the expectations were there for it to win – it didn't win. I, I would have been very disappointed. I would have been very upset. It would have been amplified because it was my favorite film of that year. Uh, La La Land last year. Yeah, I was a little upset. I was a little flustered, uh, you know, mainly because it was, well, the, the false envelope thing would have, you know, was what caused a lot of that fluster. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. If it had been just a regular opening up the envelope, Moonlight, then I would have been like, huh? You know, it would have been a jaw drop moment, but I would have said, well, okay, it makes sense here, it makes sense there, it makes sense here, it makes sense there. I probably at the time would have still said the race factor had a big playing part of that, but now it might actually just have been woke Twitter. I don't know. <laughs> it's probably more likely. But, um, which, yeah, maybe that it's the same thing. Who knows? But um, not to get too political there. But, um, but yeah, it's like, yeah, I was a little flustered, but it was more over the envelope thing, and the expectations were there for La La Land to win because it had won... It had won about everything else, so um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, I just I just get kind of angry at people that do that. Anyway, so just remember, keep your expectations in check for all that stuff as far as your personal uh, preferences and stuff. All right, I don't know. Have we said enough? I think that's enough. Uh, we're gonna check out. We'll be back again tomorrow morning. It'll be bright and early. Sun won't be up yet, but uh, Oscar nominations are uh, just they're just hours away. All right. So again, good luck if you're predicting these tomorrow. Best of luck.